our company, MJH Structural Engineers, specialize in off-site construction methods. <coughs> this lecture will cover our work with the Vision Modular System based in the UK. I will outline the types of modules and their use, how we take architectural layouts and convert them to module layouts, what the traditional building elements need to provide, some manufacturing and analysis issues, and various projects that have been completed using the system. The vision modules are constructed with a steel channel perimeter into which a concrete floor slab is poured. The walls are made up of steel box sections which provide support to the modules above. A steel roof truss provides weathering to the rooms, access on site and allows space for services. The structure of the building is contained within the modules that are assembled in the factory and delivered to site. The system uses integral corridors which are manufactured as part of the module also. The integral corridors mean less modules, therefore less transport and cranage. They also allow the building to be made weather tight quickly and allow the room's services to be brought close to the core for on-site connections. The picture at the moment here shows a uh, module as it's being dropped into place. You can see inside the corridor a number of roof trusses with the space in, in between them for services. Uh, services have been brought out of the rooms and they're hanging looped here, ready to connect into the core. In the factory, the structure of the module is assembled and squared. The concrete floor is poured with the walls in place and then the ceiling is fitted. Services are fitted, electrics and plumbing for bathrooms and kitchens and first fixed ductwork. Internal walls then are fitted and boarded. Kitchens and bathrooms are fitted including the tiling. Windows are installed and external insulation is fitted. Modules are decorated, cleaned and snagged. Roofing materials are then added to prevent water ingress during transportation and on site. Each level of modules is made weather tight each day both at roof level and on the elevations. The vision system is highly efficient in terms of floor depth with about only 350 mil required from the structural slab to the ceiling level below. We've worked closely with vision to develop their system to efficiently construct a range of building types from low rise to tall buildings. The system has been developed from a desire to achieve a flexible off-site solution with the potential for high load capacity and the opportunity to build tall. The robustness of the system also ensures that the end user will not think the building is any different to any traditionally constructed building. Just while I think of it, there is a paper which isn't qu quite complete yet, but it'll be sent out maybe by the end of the week. Uh, I'll give you an email address later on, so just in case anyone's trying to take pictures or take notes. There are two main types of module structure. Corner supported, where the structure is, is mostly in the corners of the modules, usually made up of four or six columns and wall supported modules which have a distributed system of columns around the perimeter of the module. The wall supported modules have been constructed up to 25 storeys by vision and the corner post has been constructed up to 28 storeys. For tall modular buildings the corner post system is proving to be more efficient. However the wall supported system provides a very high degree of flexibility in the building layouts so sometimes the decision of which system that we use is very difficult. Corner supported modules may be supported at discrete points, such as pad footings or columns, with the most efficient structural solution aligning directly with the structure above. Wall supported modules require linear supports or slab supports. There are a number of basic shapes that are commonly manufactured as modules. The rectangular shaped module is the most common. Sloped ends are, are very useful, especially on the perimeter of the building. Tapered modules allow for unusual shapes in the sites. Faceted modules where the corners are, are chopped off or parts of the module are used to create uh, round corners. And then stepped, in, stepped modules where they're orthogonal but there's, there's a protrusion on one side. If we look at the two types of modules, corner supported versus wall supported, and then at the different shapes to see what, what works, the rectangular module is possible and very simple with both systems. Modules with the sloped ends are simple with wall supported modules, a little bit more difficult with the corner supported modules, but very much depends on the amount of the slope. If it's a small slope, it works. If it's a large slope, it can be quite difficult. Tapered modules, they work pretty much with both systems. Stepped modules are simple enough with the wall supported system, but very unlikely unless the step is very small to be achieved with corner supported. And then setbacks on the upper levels where the one where uh, it's common in planning where the top level of the building is stepped back in 
is easily achieved again with a wall supported system but is almost impossible with corner supported modules. The next section that we cover is the uh, process of modularization. And this process covers the puzzle of fitting a modular solution to an architectural layout uh, in the most efficient way. So while modular construction is most efficient when the layouts are planned with modular in mind from the outset, particularly in tall buildings, the flexibility of, of this system allows our team to modularize existing architectural layouts which have not been planned for modular. This is often a surprise to many clients and architects, as many do not realize how versatile a modular system can be. During the modularization process, the limitations imposed by transportation, factory, constraints, craneage are all reviewed, and then the largest module size versus the level of finish achieved is considered. Ideally, each module contains full rooms allowing for completion of the finishes, but in some instances, the module break may occur within a room, a room requiring some finishing on site. So when we get an architectural layout, first we determine which parts of the building are required for traditional construction, such as the stability that's achieved from the core. We identify areas with high, high levels of finishes, such as kitchens and bathrooms. The, and these areas in particular benefit from uh, factory level finish. We look at the layouts then to maximize the amount of mod module size, maximize the module size that can be lifted by cranes or fitted on site, and minimize the site finishes. Uh, there are usually numerous ways to break up the modules. There are, there, there, there are various ways. Some of the, some of the layouts uh, look quite simple. Other areas introduce difficult enough modules. The blue ones in this one are simple enough step modules, but the one in the, in, in the middle is quite difficult to, to manufacture, even though <coughs> it is possible. <coughs> so we will, we will always look for the simple solution. And in this, in this floor layout, we end up with one step module around the core to complete the layout. In this project, which we worked on in on Olympic Way in Wembley, there are a, a number of different shaped modules. At the lower level of the building, the oval-shaped tower uh, merges with a rectangular block, and all the modules are in, in that area are pretty much rectangular. On the, upper, on the upper levels, the modules needed to change shape to provide the oval. So we ended up with modules like this on the upper level to make this oval shape. You can see here that the modules have to transition from being rectangular to the unusual shapes that we have here, sloped ends and faceted ends. On the photograph on the right hand side, you can see where the tower is coming out of the rectangular block. And that's the completed photograph. The image above is the completed building uh, from viewed from the Wembley Stadium side. And uh, there's no indication on any of the elevations that the building is modular. It would be very difficult for anyone to figure that out from uh, just standing looking on the street. When modules are erected beside traditional buildings, sometimes there's a difference in height. The traditional construction tends to be taller. The difference may be taken up with an infill structure, which provides a level platform then for the next set of modules to go on top. Alternatively, we can make taller modules on the ground floor, but obviously this introduces additional manufacturing issues which, when you have taller, so you have two different heights of modules going through your factory. Sometimes the height of the modules get too tall, and you have difficulty with transportation. In that instance, we introduce a structure in between. When, that's a low, when the step is in height is low, we can use beams, and if it gets very tall, we can use trusses or, or vertical, vertical sections. <coughs> a recent project we took on in Canterbury uses wall-supported modules, so distributed columns around the perimeter of each module. We supported them off straight footings on the foundations. We use step modules, as you can see here in the foreground, and in, on the back right, we have the faceted module making up the curved corner. You can see the brace frame uh, lying on site, ready for erection also. This is a the, the building, the modular building completed with step backs and offsets on the side of some of the modules, and then pretty close to finished building. The next type of structure we use is concrete transfer structure. You can see here on the apex site where we have a concrete transfer structure taking 25 floors of modules. The concrete slab allows a different layout for the module structure above to the open plan layout that we usually have at ground floor. These modules are corner supported and the column grid is sympathetic to the structure of the modules above. The concrete transfer may also be constructed with beams on columns. We have done projects with steel transfer decks supporting the modules. 
This provides a much lighter solution to the concrete transfer slab. The steel deck is most suitable on uh, where refurbishment or where we're adding modules to the top of an existing building. Services can cause difficulty with the steelwork, as usually when you're in the existing building, they want to try and minimize depth. You also have to think about the fire protection afterwards. The steelwork tends to introduce some technical difficulties as well. When we erect modules on steel beams, the beam deflects towards mid-span, and the top of the modules may come together, shown ever so slightly exaggerated on the sketch. And since the modules start to come together at the top, we have to continue. The, we have to consider finishes and forces. Distortion of the modules may cause cracking of brittle fishes, finishes, and overall movement may cause unpredictable forces in the connections and the structure of the modules. Where the magnitude of the movement is sufficient to cause concern, we've introduced a preload frame. The preload frame is fitted below the transfer level on site and attached to the underside of the module support beam. Load is induced in the frame that imposes close to the final deflected shape on the beam. We then level up the top of the beam with, with bearing plates for the modules. Modules are erected then on a level bearing. The preload frame is removed and the beam maintains the profile of the deflected shape. This reduces any <coughs> distortions that might occur and also reduces forces in the connections. The pre preload frame is particularly useful where there are a couple of floors and modules and the beams are not too strong and are capable of taking preload. It is quite difficult to induce preload forces. When there are a few floors of modules, there is the potential for the connections on the lower levels to come under pressure as the upper modules are erected. This is a photograph with some of the preload frames on site in a recent project. So as you can see, we're not quite at this stage with the module yet. The concrete floor in the vision system provides a robust <coughs> module for handling and transportation. When the slabs are connected together on site, they provide a very rigid diaphragm. We have undertaken the design and testing of numerous connections over the years, improving the system and making the details more efficient, while we maintain the required stiffness of the diaphragm. We then rely on traditional methods to brace the building. Steel brace frames are very good for low to medium rise as they follow the off-site process. So they can be manufactured off-site and delivered to site when, when they're needed, erected in a couple of floors at a time. The modules can go beside them. The steel frame can be erected under a couple of floors. You don't need to complete the, the construction of them in one, in one hit. You can see here, it can be very neat as well. We have a steel brace frame here in between the windows on the elevation. For taller buildings, we tend to use slip form concrete cores. The modules are in manufacture at the same time as the core is under construction. Once the modules start arriving, the erection time is relatively quick. The mix of the concrete core with the steel modules introduces some construction difficulties where we must deal with elastic sharpening, creep, and shrinkage of the concrete. The vertical support of the steelwork needs to be independent from the concrete core. Long-term creep and shrinkage reduce the height of the core over time. And if they are rigidly connected, they may impose some large loads on the steelwork and the connections. In traditional construction, the steel columns are normally remote from the concrete core, and some articulation of movement may occur without difficulty. At 25 and 28 stories, this movement is not normally very significant. With modular solutions, the steel columns in the module are erected as close as practically possible to the core, so maybe between 50 or 60 mil of the concrete. Rigid connections from the concrete to the modules would allow the transfer of the vertical load between the two different structural materials. Barrett Mahoney designed the traditional building elements on most of the vision projects. Together we look closely at the movement between the core and the modules. We also work together in terms of engineering modeling and connecting the modules to traditional building elements. When building elements are manufactured off-site, they are not loaded other than by self-weight. They're usually rigid, allowing for handling and transportation, and as a result, manufacturing accuracy may be a concern. If during the manufacturing process a column is manufactured shorter than adjacent columns, then it will not take load until the gap indicated here in the sketch is closed. As a result, the load that is expected in the short column is now distributed to the adjacent columns, and only load after contact occurs will be supported by the short column. So manufacturing inaccuracies may result in unpredictable loading in the column. When it comes to the structural analysis, Elastic analysis assumes that all the members are in contact 
but depending on how the building is assembled and the relative stiffness of the members, this may not be the case. If we consider the connections of the two diagrams shown here, the one on the list left is typical of an elastic analysis, where all the connections are fitted prior to an instantaneous loading of the members. The resulting analysis will yield compression in the central connection at the top of the two modules in, in the centre of the picture, and tension in the outer connections to the columns. In reality, similar to the sketch on the right, the modules are positioned on the beam in advance of the connections being made. The beam deflects and the columns rotate inwards. Only the end of the connection is put in place, but all the movement has already occurred and the resulting forces in those connections are minimal, if any. This is an incremental issue in modular construction, as the deflection of the beam increases as each floor is erected and the connections on the lower floors become inaccessible, but may also be subject to these increasing loads. The increasing loads will also try to distort the shape of the module, and this is where <coughs> brittle finishes may get damaged. Where beams are located beside columns, the vertical movement characteristics are very different. The beam deflections are orders of magnitude larger than the column under similar loading conditions. So where load is shared between the two members, the column will take the majority of the load. Elastic analysis assumes the beam is horizontal and connects to the column prior to application of the load. The, the column probably ends up providing some support to the beam when it deflects. In practice, the beam deflection under dead load may be complete before the connection is made, and the column may take very little of this load. As a result, the expected loads from the elastic analysis may not occur in the members that have been considered in the design. The above issues are further complicated by the addition of live load throughout the life of the building. The connections are in place and may affect the load transfer for the occupation portion of the loading. Staged construction analysis is helpful in understanding the consequences of the timing of the various connections and loadings. With nonlinear analysis of the nonlinear analysis of the stage construction, each module deflection and connections may be considered before the next set of modules and connections are made. Incremental forces may be looked at at various areas of the building. In 2009, Vision Modular Systems constructed a 25-story modular building in Wolverhampton and achieved the tallest modular building in the world. Shown here in this clip, there are three buildings with six, eight, and 25 stories of modules. For the lower buildings, the modules were constructed off a transfer slab, allowing for open plan and other use of the space on the ground floor. <coughs> for efficiency in the tall building, the modules were constructed from ground level with no requirement for transfer, and to give us poor engineers a, an opportunity to understand and assess this very tall modular build. The rooms on the southeast corner, just coming into view there now, uh, project outwards from the bottom up in groups of two floors at the lowest level, then three, four, five, and finally six on the upper level. <coughs> the tall core was constructed with slip form concrete and includes circulation, stairs, lifts, and services. The cantilevered modules extend into the modular building to give a good backspan to the cantilever. <coughs> this building was originally designed as traditional construction and only minor layout changes were required to achieve the modular layout. The cantilever modules resulted in high load in some of the uh, columns. The diagram here on the bottom left indicates relative load level in the module elements. The loading on some of the members exceeded the capacity of the members that we were working with at the time. To alleviate this issue, we introduced an additional support frame under each cantilever. It's indicated on the sketch on the right. The supporting column, as shown, was continuous up to the underside of the final cantilever. As the beam and column deflection characteristics are so different, as we mentioned earlier, the column would take all the load with minimal deflection of the beam. To achieve load sharing, we introduce a series of flat jacks, hydraulic jacks on top of the beams. The process proved to be quite complex. When a couple of levels of the flat jacks are in place and you induce deflections to the upper level beams, the resulting reactions sharpen the columns lower down the building. This in turn reduces the level of the lower support beams. This changes their deflected shape, and as a, as a result, takes load off the lower flat jacks. When these lower flat jacks are pressurized, the situation changes again. There were a number of iterations on site to get the system in balance. There's a couple of photos of the building under construction, with the cantilever's elements going in. And the photograph at the end shows all modules in place. At the end of the project, then, the team got together and we did a load test on the cantilever. 
Montreal Gardens is a recently completed uh, single to three story modular build. The walkway is shown here cantilever from the roof to provide a column free external area at ground level. Privacy screening was added to the edge of the walkways also. The complete building looks no different to other buildings in the area, certainly does not look like it's modular. In the two story part of this development, the layouts changed on the upper level, and to maximise the amount of finished modules delivered to site, we required different width modules on the ground floor to the upper level. We facilitated this with two cantilever modules on the upper level, picking up a narrow module on the upper level, which was then supported and freed up the ground floor to have a different layout. So even on this two-story mod modular development, there are obvious advantages to the flexibility of this system. This project on Sale Street was modularised from a traditional build solution. The original scheme was reinforced concrete. <clears throat> to achieve a quicker site build and minimise the disruption in this residential area, the client preferred to go down the modular route. The lower four floors of the building are overlooking a park on one side with a railway viaduct on the opposite side. The top floor of the building was higher than the railway viaduct and afforded nice views back over London. The architecture required the orientation of the top floor to change. Generally we like the modules to line and stack up. Our work is easiest when the module shapes repeat between floors and all the members align, both long walls, short walls. On this project, the top floor needed to slide over to change the elevation to allow the views back over the city. The walkways were then erected below the overhang, and on the top level the walkway stopped to the opposite side as shown here on the architectural section. In the second direction, we really liked the walls to line up. The upper occupancy in this job changed from one beds on the lower level to two beds on the, on the upper level and the modules were different sizes. As a, re as a result, we had another misalignment in the second direction. So we have misalignment of the long walls and we have an overhang and a short fall. Thanks to the versatility of the vision system, we managed to complete all the rooms off-site. We introduced the transfer structure on top of the fourth floor of modules. This allowed us to work with a different layout on the upper level. When you're working with a, s a modular system that's capable of construction into the mid-twenties, high-twenty storeys, then this type of flexibility is possible. Last year we completed an 11-storey modular build in Lewisham. The building featured a double-high colonnade with the module starting at first floor level. The modules on the lower level were supported off the concrete slab. <coughs> on the next level the modules were supported both from those modules and from <coughs> an upper level slab. This requires a high degree of accuracy to achieve predictable load sharing where it's expected. In addition, to maximise the space, the lowest modules were in, in this area here were pushed forward underneath the slab out to the face of the columns to maximise the area. This is the completed buildings and an interior shot. Apex House is one of our latest projects. The building is a 560 bedroom block of student accommodation adjacent to Wembley Stadium on the main pedestrian route to the tube station. As you can see in the image on the right, the tall building project <coughs> completes the corner between two other vision projects. The modular solution suits this very tight site where there's very little space and only one road suitable for deliveries. Steel brace frames were used on the low wings. Modules were erected from the street and dropped into position at, a, at approximately a rate of about 10 per day. The modules arrive on a trailer, they're hooked up to the lifting gear, craned into position on site, accurately located by an expert team on site, and then they're connected to adjacent modules and the core, depending on their position within the building. The slip form core was fully completed before the modules were delivered. Slip forming provides very accurate construction and this is mirrored by the high level of accuracy in the manufacturing of the modular system. This is the final module arriving. When the top floor module is lowered into position, the module below may move downwards by 7 or 8 mil in the instant of being loaded. In this shot, just as the last couple of modules are going to place, you can see the cladding is is also well underway. So Apex House, it's a 28 storey modular building with a total of 12 month construction time. The module erection was completed in 13 weeks 
with 679 modules, making up the 560 bedrooms. This is now Europe's tallest modular building. The system allows for a variety of cladding finishes. Vision applied the cladding on site as this is the best method to prevent buildings from looking modular. Correcting the cladding on the module may cause alignment issues, weathering issues, and also it's difficult to prevent the modular layout from appearing on the elevations. This fa facade onto Olympic Way offers every room in the hotel a view of Wembley Stadium. Uh, it's finished with terracotta cladding. We've used uh, brick, brick slip, GRC, terracotta, stone, rain screens, numerous claddings. There's no real restriction on the system in terms of the claddings, but there are efficiencies with certain types of finishes in relation to both time and weight. Vision also manufactured the showrooms for the Battersea Power Station apartments in a number of modules, shown here erected on the existing building. The uh, interiors are finished to, finished to a very high level. This is a two minute video uh, produced by Pocket, one of the developers that Vision have worked with recently. <coughs> it runs quickly through the factory and uh, onto the site. We've uh, completed a number of buildings in the Wembley area. <coughs> Two of them are, three of them are shown in this photograph. <coughs> photograph. <coughs> me. This project, uh, Grand Felda in Wembley, uh, steps up to 18 storeys of modules and provides student accommodation. And this is a completed building. This project, Felda House, very close to Epic Tower, uh, is also 18 storeys of modules and is student accommodation. Some typical photos from inside in the student rooms. Modules are finished to a very high standard in the factory, and a lot of the work is completed before they leave the factory. Beds are fitted, lots of furniture, wardrobes, kitchens are fitted, bathrooms are completed. M many of these things are a feature of the, the module leaving the factory. We're currently on site with Mapleton Crescent, uh, a pocket project. The modules on this project are constructed up to 24 storeys sitting on a transfer slab. The upper floors have a number of balconies uh, off the side of the modules. The cores were recently completed uh, and the slabs are currently decked out. Modules are moving through the factory in Bedford at the moment and are expected to be arriving on site in the next week. As part of our research into the modules, we also undertook some checking table tests. 
This is a one to eight scale shaking table test for the vision system. And this slow motion video gives you an idea of the shape, deflected shape of the building as it moves. In real time, you get a slightly better appreciation for the trauma that the system is put through on in, in a seismic situation. The system passed for a seismic intensity of eight or nine, which is classified as either heavily damaging or destructive. The only consequence to the system is more robust connections for the higher forces and localized rebar detailing. To finish up this presentation, I would point out that there are, um, there are probably no other modular companies with a track record that comes close to the vision modular system. The height of buildings and consistency of delivering on time is unmatched in the industry. Wolverhampton, 25 stories, 26 weeks, 805 modules. Olympic Way, 19 floors and modules, 26 weeks, 831 modules. Karma House, 18 stories, 12 weeks, 529 modules. Dexian, 18 stories, 26 weeks, 802 modules. Chapter building, 11 stories, 14 weeks, 611 modules. Apex house, 28 stories, 13 week build time, 679 modules. And Mapleton, currently on site, 243 modules. Hopefully this presentation has given you a little flavour of what we were doing with Vision in the UK, <coughs> what we've achieved over the last few years. We certainly in MJH have enjoyed working on these projects and look forward to doing many more with the Vision team. There's the, there's the paper that I'll send out to anyone that's interested uh, later in the week. Uh, an email address will pop up on screen in a minute hopefully and, and if you send me on an email I'll uh, forward on the paper. Thanks for your time and attention. Thanks very much, Michael. Uh, all those years <coughs> playing Tetris weren't wasted. Um, uh, just to open the floor to any questions. You might say your name and your affiliation. Mike was saying from Gary, building civil engineering. The uh, weight of the units, what would they be averaging out there? Um, some of the modules have gone up to around 20 ton. Uh, somewhere between 12 and 15 would be common. And width that you're working with, notice you're doing daytime deliveries, obviously that's a traffic issue. Yeah, so there's a, there's a, there's a lot goes in, a talk goes into the width of the modules and uh, when we deliver, how we manufacture, uh, so there's a lot of modules. A common width would be about three and a half meters. That's very common. Uh, four meters is comfortable for transportation. 4.2, I think, at a push. And we've done up to five and a half. 5.5, I think, in the central London. Yeah, you, just, you, you just have to watch your routes and your delivery times. So, so uh, wide modules can affect the pace of the work. If you have one or two of them on a the floor, uh, they need out of hours delivery as you say and so that, that, that can have a consequence Uh, we've considered it, but uh, the system uh, started out as a very robust system using the concrete floor. We use it for a diaphragm. It uh, makes the system very rigid. means that the modules, when you go into a finished modular building division system, you cannot, there's no way you can tell it's a, it's a modular building. The floors are minimum 150 concrete. They're very solid, very rigid. It makes the system very simple to stabilize. Just 
with, a, with our connections on the, on the corners and the modules and on the floors, we get an extremely rigid diaphragm on the floor. So we would be very slow to, to go away from that. Safety system. There's a rail. When, as the modules have been erected, there's a, a railing that goes that can be erected around the, the perimeter of the modules for safety. Uh, the guys are all roped off uh, for safe working. Some of them are harnessed onto the lifting gear as they as they go on the roof of the modules. Others are, are, are uh, connected to the modules that are previously erected. So uh, pretty much everyone is is is, is uh, safe from from that that means. And then in terms of the erection of the cladding. There's a variety of ways that that's undertaken depending on the height of the building. But mass climbers are very common, and uh, the the forces for mass climbers are very are very small, so they're easy to tie in. Oh. Yeah, um, Michael, all all the media around us have been congratulations. Obviously, uh, an inspiring presentation. Um, so I have two questions. The first one is, um, do you think you've reached the limitations with 28? Or do you think there's much more that can be achieved out of modular? And the second one is, would you, uh, could you talk to us a little bit about um, robustness and progressive collapse? <coughs> okay, sure. So uh, I suppose there's a little history to the, top, the height of the buildings. We started out in 2008. Dave Highland here in the front and ourselves. and. Our client came to us and asked us how tall could he go, and we spent a couple of weeks researching it and looking at what we could do, and we set a limit of 16 floors. One week later, he came in with Wolverhampton at 25 stories and told us we had to do it. So we started Wolverhampton with him on the basis that at any point during the construction, it could we may have to revert back to traditional build, because we weren't confident at that stage that we could do 25 floors. Uh, since then, I suppose we've done 19 floors in Olympic Way, 18 floors in one or two buildings. Shane Griffin here has done a couple of them with us. Um, and then most recently we've gone to 28. Uh, there's a company in the States that after a lot of messing around have managed to do 32 stories. So I suspect that mid-30s is, is definitely manageable. 40 stories is probably possible. And once you go above that, there are issues in terms of the size of the structural members that are required and the practicality. I don't think there's a structural limitation to how high you can go with modular. I don't think it's any different to any cons other construction method if it's thought out properly. But there are probably limitations to the feasibility of the effect on rooms of the structure and the, restric the restrictions of the shapes of modules and where you can put those columns. I think we, we have two systems that we use in the vision system. We have the wall support system where we have the, the studs running around at approximately 600 centers. And that's, that's a really efficient system up to maybe 20 stories. And after that, then the corner support system starts to kick in and become a much more efficient system. There's a sort of a, there's always a fight between which one we should go with flexibility or efficiency. But if you go with the corner support system and you start going very tall, then you end up with a point where there could be four columns beside each other. And if those columns are getting big, and that's becoming quite bulky, and it's in the corner of every room. So we've yet to see student accommodation buildings could probably go quite tall. Apartment developments, <coughs> maybe not so tall. In terms of disproportionate collapse, we've, uh, we've, we've quite a bit of certification. We've researched it with a couple of uh, significant uh, authorities in the UK. So I think uh, like Edge Mo like Ed Modular has a code which allows the relaxation of a lot of the rules in terms of disproportionate collapse because the elements in the building are capable of taking the magnitude of loads that are recommended by the steel codes, the 75 kilonewtons per se or whatever. So those forces are reduced. But when you get into this type of construction for concrete floors, uh, you're going 28 floors or whatever, then you apply absolutely the full set of rules 
the full disproportionate collapse rules that are applied in any code. The connections, we verify them. Uh, we've done testing of, this, of, uh, of the module walls. We've uh, done finite element modeling. Uh, we've, we've removed elements of the building. We've removed columns and checked to see what happens to the modules above. We provide the tying rules as per any traditional building. It's no different. That answers the problem. Yeah. So, so key element design doesn't you don't consider key element design. No, you, I think it's more you consider removal. Okay. So you take you take parts of the building out. You consider that it's been put in as boxes. Yeah. Or what happens if you whip one out or part of one out? Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's alternative load paths and making sure things are robust mm -hmm. enough to take all those forces. I'm, I'm not going to say I'm an expert in fire by any means, but the system uh, involves fire protection from inside in every box. So every module that's delivered to site is fire protected internally. So the minimum, uh, minimum uh, fire protection we can achieve, we can't go any lower than 90 minutes. Uh, two hours is pretty much standard. The underside of the slab obviously provides us top, and all the structural walls are brought up to the underside of that slab, so you have a fully fire protected box. And then, yes, on site, there are voids. The voids are 28 mil, they're quite small. Uh, actually, they're less than 28 mil, they're 28 mil, less than 26 mil boards. Yeah. So sort of like 12 or 14 mil of a, of, of a gap, which is quite small. It's very easy to fire protect, but those are fire protected in, in, there are numerous places where they have to be fire protected on the outside of the building, in various joints. Uh, it's it's pretty simple process, really. Well, I mean, co co costs in terms of modules is a, is a difficult issue at the best of times for even for us to try and figure out from our client what the cost of the building is he won't want to tell us. So I think in a lot of instances when, when you have high-end, high-quality modules, they're a little bit more expensive, but they're constructed so much faster. Like we have buildings, we have buildings say like Apex, 12-month turnaround. That's a two-year build in traditional. So we could build two of them in the same length of time. So for a client, informed clients that are coming into this industry that are looking at the modular, it's all about the time. It's not, it's not about the cost because the cost is completely irrelevant. It becomes completely irrelevant if you can turn it around and your design team focus on a second building for the second 12 months. Your construction is 12 months shorter, everything about it. So I think informed clients, clients, we get a lot of repeat interest in, in, the, in the projects. 